Are you an alien? What planet are you from? Those were the words that I heard when I tried to share my faith with some co-workers. Oh, it wasn't here at the church, don't worry. It was actually a few years ago. I was doing some freelance accounting work there for a small business. The office had a few employees there and the owner and then me. I was the new guy. And I'd only been there a few weeks and we were having our lunch break and the TV was on there in the lunchroom, always was, you know. And on came the news and there was some celebrity, I can't even remember who it was now, who was doing the things that celebrities do and all the rest, making the news for their outrageous behavior. And the owner there asked me, hey, what do you think about that situation there? And I said, well, you really want to know? And they said, yeah, I really want to know. And I took a deep breath, you know, because I knew I was about to uh, go off the gospel cliff there. And, and so I had this little one-minute answer, you know, biblically based. I just basically talked about sin and its consequences. I talked about Jesus as the only way to forgiveness and eternal life. And they all just kind of stared at me in silence for a few seconds. And then the owner broke the silence with laughter and said, are you an alien? What planet are you from? That was the very quote there. And it was said sarcastically, but I kind of took it as a compliment. You see, I am an alien. And if you consider yourself a Christian here tonight, you're an alien too. Now, as I use the word alien, uh, you might picture a person with green skin and yellow eyes and little antenna poking out of the top of the head, laser gun in hand, you know, saying, take me to your leader and all that kind of stuff. But when this person was suggesting I was from another planet, that's kind of what they had in mind. But as I admit to being an alien, that's not what I'm talking about. I remind you that the dictionary also defines the word this way. An alien is a stranger in a stranger land. A foreigner, a pilgrim passing through. Someone whose citizenship is in another country or place. And so a quick reminder of where we left off last week. You see 1 Peter 2 verse 9 and 10, to get a running start into it, you see there some words used, and Peter was calling the Christians a special people, unique people. The King James, again, peculiar people, a new nation, an alien nation, born again as citizens of a different city, a different place, citizens of heaven. And Philippians 3.20, another passage there describes our alien status so clearly. It makes a great cross-reference to this. It says, for our citizenship is in heaven, for which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. So that's the point Peter is making right here about our citizenship in heaven. He's saying, we are aliens. Don't be ashamed to be an alien. We should be acting like aliens. Now, again, don't misunderstand. We're not to be weirdos. I mean, that's important to just start at that baseline there. Our goal is not to be peculiar people in that sense, you know, not to alienate people unnecessarily. We are not supposed to be like kind of spiritual space cadets, you know, kind of shaving our heads, handing out flowers at the airport, you know, waiting for the UFOs to come and take us home. You know, nobody should, after the service, be looking for crop circles out there in the field next to the church. They're not going to be there. But see, if we live here as followers of Jesus in this world, we are going to act like aliens in really both senses of the word. We are going to be resident aliens, foreigners. We're really not from here. We're really not going to stay here. There's going to be a real homeland for us in heaven. And so we are pilgrims passing through. And to the world that watches, and they do, we will sometimes look like an alien life form some people from another planet. You know, they get invited to church and what they're half expecting is the bar scene from Star Wars. You know, that every one of us has 14 eyes and all the rest. The reason, again, sometimes is that our perspectives, our priorities are not earthly. They are not the way of the world. And we are to be aliens. What does that mean practically? Well, if you are here in this room and you are a non-citizen for any reason, well, you know from personal experience that aliens have different rules, different rights, different responsibilities when they are in a foreign place. And as we will see in this chapter, the same thing is true speaking spiritually. We also as aliens live by different rules with different rights and different responsibilities. And if you're taking notes here tonight, and I hope you are, 
I invite you to write down these three words here, which are sin, submission, and suffering. Sin, submission, and suffering. These are areas in which we can act and should act like aliens. And Peter is going to give us here some directions, some divine directions regarding these areas of life, sin, submission, and suffering. And we're going to see that these would be completely alien ideas to a person without the Spirit of God. In fact, before I became a Christian, if someone had said these things about it, I certainly would not have agreed with them. And so as we look at the Scriptures today, consider this question here. Are you an alien? As you look at 1 Peter 2.11, this is what it says. Beloved, I beg you, as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts, which war against the soul, having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may, by your good works, which they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation. Now what you see right away is that Peter ain't too proud to beg. And what is he begging? He's begging his beloved there when it comes to sin. That's the first one. When it comes to sin, act like aliens. Again, those words that we saw there, sojourners, that just means a person on a journey. Pilgrims, resident, aliens, other translations again, strangers, foreigners. Now how does that look? What does that mean? Well, there's a word there. It's an interesting word. Abstain. It talks about abstain. It means to hold yourself voluntarily away from something. And it says there, fleshly lusts. Now, whenever we hear the word lust, probably most of us think immediately of sexual lust. But that's not the only type of lust that a person can have. That's not the only limit to that word there. See, any and every lust of the flesh, and the Bible lists them in all kinds of places, but you could make this list here, greed, pride, power, anger, selfishness, addictions, the list goes on and on. Some of them external things, they're very obvious. Some of them internal things, they're not as obvious. But right away, you know, as I think about those things with you, that abstaining from sin is an alien concept for many. Abstain from sin? Why would I? Why should I? See, what's the world's way when it comes to that? Certainly not abstinence, but indulgence, really overindulgence. And when you think about it, many people think that's what life is supposed to be about, right? A life of lust, chasing your lust. Go for what feels good, whatever looks good. Just grab that. And so again, abstaining, that word is an alien concept, foreign and strange. And so when it comes to sin right away, you'll see this is going to be a difference between a believer and an unbeliever, it's going to be something that would immediately set a person apart, is how they think about sin and what they do about it. Because it says right there that these things war against the soul. Now, I like thinking about that right there. The, the word war in the original language there, it's not describing a single battle that's kind of over, whoop, that was quick, you know, one of these airstrikes that's over in a moment, no. It's talking about a long-term military campaign, something that is a continued conflict, in fact, a lifelong struggle. And this comes as a surprise to some Christians that there's a struggle with sin even after becoming a believer. In fact, you struggle more with sin sometimes after becoming one than before becoming one. Why? Because before you gave in to sin, and now there's a change that you say, I don't want to give in to sin, and that's when the war really begins. See, when I became a Christian, my soul was saved, that's true. And you see that I went there from being a citizen of hell to a citizen of heaven. That's a good change of citizenship there, at peace with God. But at that very moment, another war broke out, which I would call the civil war. The civil war is that war within a person of whether or not they're going to let sin win or not. See, in my spirit and soul were saved, that's true. But this is what the Bible teaches, is that my flesh, my body is still wanting to do things the world's way. It didn't really get saved. In fact, it's going to have to be left behind at some point. And so what you see is this picture that's being painted, armies at war with each other, two sides of a civil war inside my flesh and my spirit. Now, who's going to win that war? Well, this is what it comes down to. Anyone with a military background will tell you that the side that is supplied will win. The one that has uh, soldiers that are well-fed, well-led, well-supplied, they will likely win the war over the long haul, especially if it is a long war. 
And so this is the principle I want to leave with us tonight on this subject, which is that you cannot sin and win. You cannot sin and win. When it comes to the civil war within, you cannot sin and win. And if I indulge in my flesh, if I say, well, you know, I'll feed it, what am I doing? Who am I hurting? Well, hear it well. You're hurting yourself most. You are your own worst enemy at that point. I am my own worst enemy at that point. So many people have the wrong view of sin. Like, well, you know, God doesn't want to have me have fun, so he says something about sin, but I can be forgiven, so I'll just go ahead and do it, and then I'll ask for forgiveness. You know what you're doing? You're warring against your soul. You're warring against your own soul. You're li- losing a civil war there. I'm the loser when I do that. And so it's interesting thing about lust of all types. See, there's a lie that lust tells, and I've heard it, and you've heard it, because we all hear the same lies, which is this. Feed me, and I'll leave you alone. You know, just throw me a bone. I'll leave you alone. Just give me something to gnaw on, you know. But here's the thing about lust. The more you feed it, it's like a fire. The more you feed it, the hungrier it gets. And pretty soon, it burns everything in its sight. Feed me and I'll leave you alone. Next time you hear that, you can know it's lust's lie. Starve it and it will leave you alone. That's the only answer there. You find yourself on the wrong side of a civil war if you give in to sin. And the great thing about habits or the bad thing about them, it works both ways, is the more you say no, the easier it gets to say no. The more you say yes, the easier it gets to say yes in these areas. And so some Christians wonder why they're so weak, why they're so defeated. You know, they know that they're saved, that their soul is saved, that their spirit is redeemed, and yet their flesh so weak. Why is it that this civil war within always seems to go to the wrong side? Could it be, could it be that we sometimes are not acting like an alien when it comes to sin? We're thinking sin is a natural thing, that it's a normal thing, that it's not a foreign object to be pushed out of our lives. And so could it be that we continue to conform to the world's ways in some ways? Same goals, same priorities, same perspectives on things. What's the media's message in this country? Well, it can't be missed. It's everywhere you turn. Indulge in what the flesh wants. Feed the flesh. Live the lust life. Everybody's doing it. Could it be that ignoring God's word in this area, the simple truth that you can't sin and win, we forget, man, I'm not acting like an alien when I do that. See, abstain. He talks about separating yourself from the worldly ways, holding yourself back. And I know there's some young folks in the room, and this isn't only uh, addressed to them, of course. But, you know, sometimes you hear things like people talking about safe sex and stuff like that. And one of the things I heard once, it was so important, they said, you know what? There's no such thing as a condom for your soul. There's no such thing as the fact that you're warring against your soul when you sin, and you may protect yourself physically, but there's no way to protect yourself spiritually against what sin does to a person's soul. And so remember, we're pilgrims passing through here, and if we're looking for all our pleasure here, this isn't our homeland anyway. We're just visiting this place. You know, it's a nice place to visit, but I wouldn't want to live here, not in this world. I like maybe taking a few pictures along the way, but I'm not going to stay here any longer than the Lord wants me to. And so we would expect maybe to have some rejection here, some pain here. And unbelievers, they live like this is all there is because for them it is. And so not too surprising, but we as aliens ought to know better, right? That's something that we see here. People think it's strange, the Bible says, that you don't dive into sin with them. But that's okay. It's okay if they think you're an alien. See, our lives ought to look strange. They ought to look foreign to others. And so when we act here like aliens, we can be misunderstood, right? We can be misrepresented. We can be made fun of. That can happen. And if you think about it in a purely physical sense, right, if a person is a resident alien, if someone's a foreigner in a land, if somebody is not from around there, they can seem strange and people can make fun of their accent or the way they talk or the way they dress or whatever else. And they say, man, these people are weird. And that is true Maybe of you. Maybe people look at you, you're so different. Or maybe you think, I am so different. Good, you're supposed to be different. I remind you, the letter was originally written by the Apostle Peter to Christians who were scattered throughout the Roman Empire. And maybe you've heard the cliche, you know, when in Rome, do as the Romans. You know, when in Rome, act like the Romans. And that could have been the advice that he gave, but he didn't. See, the imperial cult there, that's what really ran Rome. It was the worship of the Roman rulers. It was them as gods, little g there, you know. 
and their worship was pagan. It was really self-indulgent rubbish. You know, there they had 1 Peter 2, 12. It talks about the fact that when they invite you to their church services, they're real surprised that you don't want to go. Why? Because it was one big flesh fest. And he says they, sp they slander you. They say, hey, you're not a very Roman religious guy. Why don't you engage in the same stuff we do? You know, when you act like an alien towards sin, you're going to be seen as different, as those who would be condemned by some. I kind of picture it this way. You know, let's say there were two Romans talking about their Christian neighbor, you know, over the fence, like neighbors do, even in Rome. And you can picture them saying, man, I can't stand these Christians. I mean, they are weird, man. They're strange. I mean, I invited one to the orgy. I've been inviting him all month. You know, we're having the big one this, this time. I mean, you know what he told me? Oh, no, thanks. I, I'm married and I'm faithful to my spouse. I mean, come on. This guy's so happy all the time. Happy, 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 you know? The other day, I go over to borrow the, ask him if I can borrow the, the uh, lawnmower. He said, I'll just mow it for you. What a weirdo, man. And he did it with a smile. Good attitude. All the rest of this stuff. Man, it's, it's just so bizarre. I mean, the neighborhood is really, really, I think another one's moving in down the street. I mean, how foreign, how alien. Exactly. See, and as Christians, we should not feel at home with sin. We shouldn't feel normal about it. If it bugs you, if there's sin in your life and it bothers you, that's a sign of growth, see? Sometimes people go, man, I'm so discouraged as a Christian, there's still sin in my life. That's good that it bothers you. See, because it probably didn't used to. And it ought to feel like a foreign object, like a splinter in your finger. I've got to get this out. Abstain. Hold yourself away from it. So when it comes to sin, abstain. But when it comes to sinners, well, that's a little different story. We shouldn't alienate ourselves from them. See, a lot of people would take this so far as they'd say, hey, I've got to insulate myself. I've got to isolate myself from Christians. I'll go live off in a commune and we can just all be aliens there. You know, we'll just do that. But the Bible makes it clear. Don't hold yourself away from sinners. See, verse 12, if you look on your page there, he talks about being among the Gentiles. Gentiles was just a way of saying among the unbelievers, among the people who don't have the truth of God. So again, that phrase, you already heard it today. Pastor Pedro put it in the prayer. He said, in the world, but not of the world. The Christian is meant to be in the world. The problem is when the world is in the Christian. See, that's when things kind of go south. Now, this little analogy helps me to figure it out in my own life when I think about it. I, I don't know much about boating, but I know this. A boat was meant to be in the water. That, that's its whole deal, right? It was made for that. But water was not meant to be in the boat. Okay, so boat in water, good. Water in boat, bad. Okay? And there is this little thing called a bilge pump. And that bilge pump is down there making sure that the water is outside the boat so that the boat can float, right? And so what you see in your life is there's that bilge pump that God's saying, hey, we've got to get the sin out. But that doesn't mean I want you away from sinners. In fact, I want you around them in some sense so that you can be an alien so that they would want to be an alien too as they look at your life and start going, well, wait a minute. All those things that I say about them that are so bad, those are the very things I wish I had in my life that are missing. See, there's something that happens over time when aliens are there among others. And sometimes you might look at a person's life and say, well, do I need to get away from this sinner? See, it's one thing to say you don't have to get away from all sinners or we just have to leave the world. But there are times when God will put his finger on a certain sinner and say, that person is clogging up your bilge pump, baby. And so when you think about it, this is the question. When you think about a certain person's influence on your life here today, maybe there's some person that God says, you know what, that person is sinking your boat. And you may have this rationale that you say, but I gotta save them. No, Jesus needs to save them. But it's not always our ability to be able to do that in individuals' lives. So a review here, the first word, sin. We need to act like aliens when it comes to sin. But there's a second word that we need to think about, and that's the word submission. If I haven't upset you already, or the word of God hasn't, we need to act like aliens when it comes to submission to authority. That's what he says there in verse 13. Look, it says, Therefore submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether to the king as supreme, or to the governors as those who are sent by him for the punishment of 
evildoers for the praise of those who do good. And verse 14 and a half says, or to the ushers who tell you to sit a certain spot or not move. Oh, oh, wait, it doesn't say that. I just added that. But if there's ever been a word that sounds strange and foreign in our society to modern ears, it's the word submit. Submit? You see, in fact, the idea of submission to authority is even sometimes alien and alienating to people who consider themselves Christians. They say, wait a minute, submit. Are you kidding? Are you kidding? Are you an alien? What planet are you from, Pastor Scott? Don't you see how corrupt the government has gotten? Don't you see what's going on in the world? Don't you know the conspiracies that are going on worldwide? I mean, haven't you read Area 51? Don't you know these things? Don't you know it's all a big plot? Look, if you think submission's a touchy subject when it comes to governmental authorities and stuff, wait till we get to the next chapter, 1 Peter 3, and talk about it in the context of family and marriage. Now, here's the great thing. Pastor Pedro gets that one. <laughs> it's his week. He can have that hot potato. But regardless of the specific context of the subject here of submission, it's an important one to think about for a moment. See, our society has become increasingly anti-authority. We have just a thing that's automatically in us as human beings that's rebellion. I watched it in my own kids. It came through the mother's side. It was amazing how that happened, but... <laughs> But we're obsessed, you know, with our rights. This isn't fair, you know, the kid's fair. They're not being fair and all that sort of stuff. Our personal privileges. Suspicious, immediately critical of anybody in any authority of any type. And Peter makes a statement so clear here, it's impossible to miss it unless we want to, which, of course, we don't. 1 Peter 2, verse 13, he says, Submit yourself to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake. When he's talking about ordinances there, he's talking about governing bodies. He's talking about police forces. He's talking about military forces. He's talking about the IRS. Ooh, that one's coming up. <laughs> National, state, local leaders and laws, parents and teachers and all the rest. Now, you want to act like an alien? You want to be a real rebel? Submit. <laughs> That's going to be very rebellious. That's the opposite of the world's way. Our mission is submission. That's important for us to know as Christians. Our mission is submission. You want to go to our leader and ask him what it's about? Jesus Christ, a submitted man. Powerful. Most powerful in the universe. And yet, submission. And this is really not about submission to man. See, you even see it in that statement. It's about submission to God. He says, submit to the authorities for the Lord's sake. And so during his trial, you may remember, Jesus there got tested on this one. He didn't just preach it. He actually had to live it. And Pilate told Jesus there, don't you know that I have the power to crucify you or to let you live? And Jesus said, you know what? You would have no power at all unless my Father in heaven had given it to you. What's he acknowledging there? All authority, even the ones that are not so hot, are there under the authority of God, only because God allowed it, the sovereignty of God. And notice something in 1 Peter 2, verse 13. It's real important. It says, submit to the king. Now, if you know what that means, the king, it's not democracy, right? Now, this is where I'm really on some thin ice. This is not America. I mean, it's not talking about American government. Now, God has certainly blessed America, but that is not the only government that has God anywhere in it. See, democracy is one form of government that God allows, and thank God for it. I love it, love living under it. But throughout history, God has worked through... Other forms, monarchies, dictatorships, even totalitarian governments have been allowed under God's authority. Now, again, don't go further than I'm going here. Don't misunderstand me. I love this country. I love America. I salute the flag. I pledge allegiance to it. I'm grateful to God for my freedoms. I'm grateful for those who have defended it, are defending it, and will defend it. But far too many Christians confuse their Christianity with their nationality. See, and they forget to act like aliens in this area. Hey, wait a minute. We are not citizens of this state or really any other as much as we are citizens of heaven. And so, you know, people sometimes along the way will ask, well, what are you, Scott? Are you a Republican? Are you a Democrat? Are you an Independent? You're not a commie, are you? A Socialist? 
No, I'm an alien, all right? I'm an alien. And though I was born here in the United States, and I value my citizenship here, and spiritually speaking, it's a good reminder. I'm just a resident alien here, you know? That's all it means. Now, think about this. A pilgrim passing through has more responsibilities, not fewer. I think that's important to point out there. Christians ought to be the very best citizens of whatever state they find themselves in. Wherever they regard, whatever, wherever they reside, regardless of the form of government, that government ought to say, boy, there's something about these Christians. I wish we had more of them. And see, not all governments are going to do that. And that's why he says, what if they're ungodly? Well, he says, submit anyway. Paul wrote it also, so we couldn't miss it. We say, well, I don't really listen to Peter. I listen to Paul. Okay, well, Paul said this. Romans 13, 1 and 2. Let every soul be subject to the governmental authorities, for there's no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God and will bring judgment upon themselves. Now, that is hard to argue with there. Both Peter, Paul, and Mary, if you'd asked her, would say... <laughs> On submission to rulers. Well, remember, this was during the reign of Caesar. This, these were not great leaders, okay? Nero isn't going to win any good guy awards in history. He was terribly ungodly, absolutely cruel. And the Roman government, again, in which Jesus operated, was pagan. It was involved in many, many ungodly things. And I never saw Jesus leading a protest. What did he do? Well, he changed lives individually from inside. That's what really needed to happen. He needed to get people governed by God individually. That's what changes the world. And so Jesus still said, hey, give to Caesar what's Caesar's, give to God what's God's. What's God's? My absolute allegiance. No matter where I live, no matter who I live under. What is Caesar's? Well, my everything else, I guess. The submission due to a person that acts in authority, whether they do it right or they do it wrong. And God will hold all authority to account. See, we need to know that. We need to know that. What's the proper use of power? It said it right there in verse 14. The punishment of evildoers and the praise of those who do good. Now you say, wait, wait a minute, though. A lot of governments get that exactly backwards. They praise the evildoers and they uh, punish the people who are doing good. Well, guess what? God lets things rise and fall, doesn't he, if you look over history. Nobody lasted very long in power if they did not have a godly authority. But God will also hold to account those who are under authority, and probably that applies to a lot more of us. We're probably not the mover and shaker of society so often. But you know what? What's my responsibility then? It says right there, submit. My mission is submission. It's a subversive mission in a way because... Through submission, lives get changed so much more sometimes than through rebellion. You see, submission is more than just obedience. It's a willing obedience. It's more of an attitude thing even than an action thing. And again, it does draw attention. People are amazed by it because it's so rare. See, there was a boy who was in a classroom, and he was a rebel there. And he was standing when he was supposed to be sitting, and the teacher told him, hey, sit in your chair. And he looked at that teacher defiantly and said, I'm not going to sit. You can't tell me what to do. This is a free country. You know, we used to use that one. I always wondered what they did in communist countries when someone said that to them. But, but said, so you can't tell me. You said, uh, the teacher said, sit down now or I will call the principal right now. I've already been there. I don't care. I'll call your parents. All right, well, he was a little bit concerned with that. So he sits down, but he looks her in the eye again and says, you know what? I may be sitting down on the outside, but I am standing up on the inside. <laughs> And see, that is not submission, really, because submission is an attitude of the heart. And our mission is sub submission in life. We have a leader who showed us that in Jesus. Any exceptions to it? Well, a lot fewer than we might wish sometimes. You know, we're always thinking there's got to be a loophole, right? I mean, uh, it, this circumstance where I'm kind of having trouble with it, submission. See, submission only gets tested when you don't agree with the uh, leadership in a way <laughs> because it's easy to submit when we're going the same way i can't tell any difference between submission and non-submission but see this there are some highest authority is god always remember that authority goes down chain of command what's the highest chain of command god so if there's any conflict anywhere in the chain of command god wins he always has the trump card now, I think about it in just a personal example, you know, and again, I try to do this as clearly as I can. I've had, had a number of different jobs, and, 
uh, often in the financial area. And that's an area where I like to get real clear with people before I would get hired on as a contractor, you know, as a, a person coming in to do their books. And so I had to be very, very clear with them. And the way I would say it to them is, I will not lie to you, but I will not lie for you. And if I have to lie for you, I really, you don't want me for the job. You know, I, w I will be honest with you, but see, if you on the phone tell me to tell the customer, hey, the check's on the way, and it's not, I can't do that. You know, but you can trust me on this side, but you can trust me on the other side too. And for some employers, that was like, eh. See, I like it when you don't lie to me, but I, I need you to lie for me. You say, I can't do that because I answer to a higher authority. Now, when the religious rulers there told Peter not to preach Christ anymore, he said it well. He said, hey, you know what? You got to judge for yourself. You guys are judges. You know, you're pretty smart. Should I obey you or should I obey God? I guess I got to obey God and whatever the consequences may be. And he suffered those consequences, but he did it in a respectful and honorable way. And Jesus himself never rebelled against Rome, nor did he really encourage his people to do that, even when they were all waiting for him to do it. They're like, overthrow the government, man. It's like, no, this isn't a hippie revolt, guys. See, Jesus said, I came to act like an alien. I came to show you how to do it too, a mission of submission. And I think about it personally. I spent a year of my life, it was a great time, a year of my life as a student overseas, living in London and Part of the deal with that there, I was an alien. You know, I was a resident alien for a little while there and spent two months traveling all throughout Europe. Now, one of the things is I, I'm kind of challenged when it comes to languages, you know, and I was well aware of the fact that there's kind of a stereotypical ugly American, you know, and, and there's that obnoxious person, you know, who's just like loud and they're there in Paris and they expect Paris to be like Paris, Texas. And where's the ATM? There's not enough Coke machines around here. Hey, why doesn't anyone speak English and stuff? You know, and you go, wow. I, I said, I am going to make sure I am not like that. I'm going to make sure I don't send that message. So I went out of my way to be gracious. You know, I, I apologized profusely for my idiocy in not knowing languages. You know, I realized, hey, I, I'm humble here. I'm at your mercy. I, I, I'm respectful of authority. You know, if some guy blew the whistle at me and yelled at me, I, I did, hey, you know, I'm an American. Here's my passport. You know, I didn't do any of that. I just tried my best to represent my homeland and say, you know what, at least may they see one who's a little different. That was the idea, spiritually representing that. That's what we're doing as Christians, I hope, is realizing that there are a lot of stereotypes out there about Christians. I used to have them before I was a Christian. Like, oh man, they're all like this. You know, because you meet the few that are like that and you think they're all like that. But representing heaven, we're representing Christ and we need to remember that. So let's represent him well because that's what it says in verse 15. This is the will of God that by doing good, you might put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. Now, I won't get a show of hands, but anyone here knows some ignorant, foolish people? You know, that you're like, man, I need to silence that person. Well, it tells us how right here. Verse 16, as free, yet not using liberty as a cloak for Miami Vice, <laughs> but as bond servants of God. Well, what are we doing there? Well, think about it. It's saying you're, you're free, but you're not free just to kind of be a bad representation of Christ. It's one of the most common questions. I wonder what God's will is for my life. You know, ever thought that one? Ever heard that one? Oh, what is God's will? I wish I knew what God's will for my life is. It says it so very clearly here in verse 15 that our good deeds, that our lives, our alien lives, our submissive, obedient, different lives would shut the mouths of ignorant and foolish people. It's like zipping their lip. The, the word literally there is muzzle. It's like picturing them all at the water cooler, you know. Yip, 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 here they come. Here comes Moses. <laughs> Let's see if he'll part the water. You know, all that. So, oh, it's the Pope. You know, those things that you get at work. I know what it's like. He says, how do you silence that? By fighting back? No. The mission of submission. See, unbelievers would look at our lives and they'd have really no legitimate complaints. He says, as free but not using your liberty as a cloak to cover up sin. See, there are a lot of Christians who do this. You know, they, they say, well, we're not under law, right? Doesn't it say that somewhere in there, you know? Well, there's nothing worse than half a verse. That's true. It does say that. But it goes on to say so much more. And they'll use that to justify why they don't obey some law. You know, we're not under law. I'm under grace, you know. 
I'm a citizen of heaven. I'm a child of the king. Jesus said the children of the king don't pay the taxes and all that. I don't answer to anybody but God. I got a tattoo right here. Only God can judge me. You go, whoa, you know, that sounds really spiritual. But it's not biblical. That's the problem. See, it's using liberty as a cover-up for vice. And we are free from sin, the Bible says, but not free to sin. There's a big difference of those. We're still under God's authority. Now under God's authority. It used to be under the authority of sin, that sin told us what to do. What a great master, God, who sets us free. And he says, you know what? Act as aliens toward all authority. Our mission is submission. Verse 17, he says, honor all people. Love the brotherhood. Fear God. Honor the king. There's a lot there, but you know, the bottom line is this. Honor all people. Think what that does if we would really just think about that. Honor all people. Not most people. Not the ones you like. Jesus was willing to die for every person on the planet. Even the people we don't like so much. See, he didn't have a criteria where he said, well, I'll die for the, the tall ones but not the short ones. Or the thin ones but not the uh, you know, more ample ones. Uh, I, the ugly, the smart, the dumb, the nice, the naughty, what, you know, rich, poor, whatever. Somebody once said something to me that changed my life. I hope it will yours, or at least some of the things said tonight will, because I, I was just in a place where there were some people who had kind of fallen off the end of life, you know, if you know what I mean, and you were just looking at them, and, and somebody said, you know what, every one of these people here used to be somebody's little boy or little girl. Now, as a guy who's had a little boy and little girls, boy, that hit my heart like a ton of bricks. And from then on, I said, you know what? I'm going to try, with God's help, to view life that way. To not say, oh, there's a waste of skin. You know, there's a person who, uh, there's no point with them. No. And that was a person worth dying for, Jesus thought. And so an honor that comes to people, loving the brotherhood, the faith family, have a special affection and bond with believers. I hope you do. Sometimes, sadly, there's a lot of sibling rivalry and fighting among families, you know. And you think about it in churches, sometimes... People treat fellow Christians worse than they treat the unbelievers, and I hope that would never be the case here. And so he says, love the brethren. Love the brotherhood. Fear God. Honor the king. Again, summing it up, our mission is submission. And submission certainly is an alien concept to our society. It is going to be alien to our minds in our natural selves. But if we refuse to, to submit to authority, what we're really doing, when we refuse to submit to human authority, we're really refusing to submit to God's authority. So, again, acting as aliens when it comes to sin. Acting as aliens when it comes to submission. And here comes the last one, suffering. Acting like aliens when it comes to suffering, especially unjust suffering. See how Peter puts it here, verse 18. He says, Servants, be submissive to your masters with all fear, not only the good and gentle, but also to the harsh. For this is commendable, if because of conscience toward God, one endures grief, suffering wrongfully, for what credit is it if you are beaten for your faults and you take it patiently? But when you do good and suffer, if you take it patiently, this is commendable before God. Now, Peter here draws a close connection between submission and suffering. And if you've ever submitted to authority in any way, you know that there can be an outcome that is suffering. I mean, you think at, at first you go, man, if I submit to authority, they're going to praise the good and punish the bad. And again, sometimes they get it backwards. And he says right here, what do I do? Well, if you submit to unjust authority and you suffer injustice, well, what about your rights? What about your rights? Well, Peter was speaking here to servants, slaves, and they really had no rights. But they did have a responsibility, as he puts here, an opportunity, really, which is to act like aliens, even as a slave. <laughs> the best slave possible. He said, just be the best slave possible. And God looks on at that and he says, that's commendable. Now, some have criticized Christianity right at this point because they say, well, it doesn't condemn slavery. It should have come right out and said it. Well, you know what? That criticism actually comes from a misunderstanding of Jesus' mission and message because it was much bigger, actually, than just physical slavery. And certainly... Slavery is condemned as a sin by all of the things that the Bible teaches, which is about freedom and certainly not putting yourself over another person. There's no truly Christian society that has continued in slavery, but this is so important. See, the real slavery is sin, 
The real slavery is sin. And Jesus Christ didn't come to reform societal uh, norms and all the rest. He didn't just come to that. That would have been a much smaller mission. That was the mission many people thought the Messiah was on. But it wasn't. He came to save sinners from eternal damnation. See, it, the worst that someone might have is on this earth... Let's say a hundred years as a slave. Well, that's horrible, but it doesn't even begin to compare to all eternity. And so Jesus came to set people, all people, everywhere, under any governmental form, anywhere in the world, free spiritually, regardless of where they find themselves physically. And I have heard it said, and you've certainly seen it too, there are people behind bars who are more free than people who are sitting in bars by their own free will. And so for our purposes, it's best here to think of this section maybe as it applies to our life directly, which is employee-employer relationships. Now, my boss is not a harsh boss. He's a wonderful guy. He's sitting right over there. Now, but you probably have a bad boss. Okay, so let's talk about you instead of me. At work, it's important to act as an alien toward our employees and employers and all the rest, even if we suffer in the process. See... It talks there about harsh. It's kind of interesting because the word there in Greek is scolios. It means crooked and warped. It's where we get scoliosis, you know, curvature of the spine. It's saying some guy who's just warped. And it says, what are you supposed to do to that guy? You know, plot a coup, you know, overthrow the guy. No, pretty alien concept here again. Suffering. Suffering in it. Now, what does this mean for us? Again, I like to put this in a principle that maybe we'll remember. For believers, God gives no buffering from suffering. See, a lot of times we think, oh man, if I become a Christian, my life's going to get better. <laughs> God's going to put this little you know, force feed around, field around me and I'll just go through life and you know, anyone who gets in my way, hey, in the name of the king, down you go. You know? <laughs> Listen, there's no buffering for our suffering. God isn't going to insulate us from those things sometimes, protect us from it, pull us out of it. Why? Because the very deal is that we are supposed to be in the midst of that situation, shining a light, looking a little different in the dark. And so it's commendable, it says before God, when we suffer injustice with patience. That doesn't mean that God delights in injustice or that he is all about undeserved suffering. You know, that's my thing. I love it. No, in fact, the Word of God makes it clear that we're supposed to alleviate suffering wherever we can. And those are some of the good works that he said that we should shut the mouths of people with. But see, the key to understanding the command is found right there in the word commendable. In verse 19 and 20, it uses the word twice, commendable. Commendable is actually the word charis. It means grace. It's an act of grace. He says, this is an act of grace when you do this. What is grace? It's undeserved favor. It's the very thing that God showed us. So when we show grace, what are we doing? We are acting like our leader. See, this is the specific context of this command. When someone mistreats you for your faith, because you're an alien, do something alien. Show them grace. And God knows one of the most difficult things to do in the world is to suffer for something you didn't do. See, I don't like suffering for things I did do but I really don't like suffering for something I didn't do. I mean, talk about something that brings out the, but, 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 but it's not fair. I didn't even do it. They, they did it. You know, that sort of thing. As a kid, boy, that, that was it, you know, between my sister and I. To suffer unjustly and to maintain an attitude of humility and submission, it's impossible in our own strength. It's an act of grace. It's an alien act. And see, the rest of the chapter, it's cool. Uh, it's, it's actually very tied in with Isaiah 53. Now, don't turn there and see. We'll find out if you can submit to authority right there. Because some of you are going to say, I'm going to turn there whether you like it or not. But turn there later. Go look at it later. Isaiah 53, actually an awesome, awesome prophetic verse. A whole chapter that talks about Jesus and how he would be the suffering servant. And how he would be these things. And Peter just peppers this whole section with little quotes from it. On sin, submission, and suffering. Listen to Peter's version here in verse 21 as he plagiarizes it, but he can do that because God let him. So it says, For to this you were called because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps, who committed no sin, there was no deceit found in his mouth, who when he was reviled didn't revile in return, when he suffered he did not threaten, but committed himself to him 
who judges righteously. So this is so important what it says here. It says, to this we were called. Now again, sometimes we have certain verses that we love to highlight, you know, about what God's going to do great in our life. Yeah, highlight that one. And then you come across suffering, to this you were called. Hmm. I'll highlight this with a black pen, a very large black sharpie. Whoa, wow, I can't read it anymore. Oh, well. <laughs> to this we were called. What's the natural response when we suffer injustice? Complain, <laughs> revile in return. The very things he said Jesus didn't do. Threaten people back, defend myself, come. Call. I'm getting my, that's it, I'm getting my attorney on the line and that's it. talk to them. That's the worldly way, isn't it? But to take injustice patiently and with quiet confidence, that's very otherworldly. That's unnatural. That's alien. Exactly. That's so much like Jesus. If ever there was an alien, if ever there was a guy who was not of this world, even though he was in it, if ever there was a person from another planet, it was Jesus. That's why he caused such a stir. He was in the world, but not of it. He was truly a citizen of heaven. Now, why did he leave that? You ever thought about that? If I were a truly a citizen of heaven, see, I get to be a citizen of heaven, but I haven't been there yet. But Jesus, well, he, he started there, and he came and said, well, I'll be a pilgrim passing through this place. Why would he do that? You see it in the last verses of this chapter where we'll end up tonight. Verse 24 and 25, it says, Who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. For you were like sheep going astray, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. I love that passage there. It tells me why Jesus came. And it says right there, he came for me. That's why he made that round trip from heaven to the cross and back to heaven. Because without that trip that he took to the tree, heaven would have been empty. At least it wouldn't have had me in it, that's for sure. You know, I wouldn't have gotten that passport, that citizenship. Why? Because someone had to pay for that. And I didn't have what it took. And I was alienated from God. That's what the Bible says, alienated. It means to be separate, to be separated to be having a large gulf between you and God. And, it, and the Bible says it's our sin that did that, that we were going astray. You know the picture there of a sheep going bad, you know, just going off into the middle of wherever. A sheep without a shepherd. And what you see there is that Jesus himself described himself as the good shepherd. He said, you know what the good shepherd does? He lays down his life for the sheep. He would put his life on the line for the sheep. And that's exactly what he did. His life for my life. His life for my sin. God's son for my sin. And because of that, now I have a different destination. No longer a natural citizen just of this world. Sure, I'm still here, but I have a hope. I have a future. I have a home in heaven. And so, again, this is a great place to visit. Don't get me wrong. You say, oh, you don't like the world? Man, I think we enjoy it more than anyone else because we know it's not all there is. But that good shepherd there, see, there's something wrong with our life if, if we feel right at home here. If you say, man, I love this place. Don't want to leave. And there's something wrong. You have to ask yourself, are you an alien? What planet are you from? You know, do you fit real comfortably in this world? You say, boy, I love it. It's, it fits like a glove. Are you starting to say, you know, I don't like it here. There's got to be something more. Well, my friends, there is. And if you think about this, acting as an alien, well, it's three areas that are big ones that we talked about tonight. In the areas of sin. Just remember this, you can't sin and win. You might be looking like you're ahead right now and you're winning the sin game. You can't sin and win. In the end, sin is always a losing game. Are you acting like an alien in the area of submission? Well, you know, you may think you're bucking authority. Man, I'm such a rebel. But again, any dead fish can flow downstream. It takes a live one to go back in the right direction. And Jesus is the right direction there. And our mission of submission, well, it's just to switch authorities in our life. And you may think you're your own authority, but the Bible says, no, you're really a slave of sin. 
Are you acting like an alien in the area of suffering? Do you think, man, there should be buffering from suffering? You know, I, I shouldn't have to deal with things. I don't understand, you know. Do you demand your rights every time you're wronged? Well, could it be that you're still not acting like an alien? And, you know, here's the great thing. If anyone, if you're living a life that's different here and you start to get discouraged ever in that and someone asks you, are you an alien? You know, you can just tell them, hey, thanks for noticing. <laughs> Let me... Let me take you to my leader. And that's what I want to do tonight, really. Again, just we're going to close out here. The band's going to come back up. I'm going to ask you to close your eyes, bow your heads. And I'm just going to sp speak for a moment to any in the room who might be what the Bible describes here as sheep gone astray. Sheep gone astray. It says there in the scriptures that we all have wandered. All of us. You know, it's not just one of us or two of us. All of us have. But Peter was giving encouragement to them and saying, hey, you know what? You've returned to the overseer of your soul, to the shepherd of your soul. So that begs the question. I know you've gone astray in your life. The question is, have you returned? Have you returned to the shepherd of your souls? Have you come back to your creator? Well, tonight's an opportunity to do that. And how do you do it? Well, what we're going to do, again, with our eyes closed, with our heads bowed, I'm just going to give you an opportunity to raise your hand. Why should you do that? Well, by raising your hand, what you're saying is yes to Jesus. You're saying yes to the shepherd of your soul. You're saying, I realize I can't sin and win, but Jesus won over sin. He beat death. He resurrected and he offers that citizenship in heaven, that home in heaven, to anyone who would follow after him, anyone who would put their faith in him. And so by raising your hand, that's what you're doing. You're making a declaration. I want to follow Jesus. You're saying yes to him. You're saying yes to the forgiveness of your sin. You're saying yes to a future and a hope. And the great thing is, in the very act of saying yes to him, you're also saying no to sin. You're saying no to death. You're saying no to hell. It's a wonderful thing to make a decision for Christ, but it's something you need to do. The Bible never gives us a tomorrow to make this decision. It says today is the day of salvation. So if you're here in this room and you know, hey, I'm a sheep and I have gone astray, well, now is the time to return to your shepherd. He's looking for you. You may think you're just visiting this church, but this is him visiting you coming close to you. So I'm just going to ask you if that's your need, if you want to make a declaration, if you want to say yes to Christ here today, I'm just going to ask you right where you're sitting to raise your hand now, get it up high so I can see it, and I'll lead you in a prayer. God bless you. I see you there. God bless you over here in the back. I see you as well. Anyone else here tonight? Don't let the opportunity pass if God is speaking to your heart here. Anyone else? Raise your hand up high so I can see it. I'll lead you in a prayer of salvation that will change your life forever. I see you back there too. God bless you. For those of you who raised your hand, I'm just going to lead you in a prayer. The Bible says if we confess Jesus as Lord, if we believe in our hearts, we will be saved. And so repeat this prayer after me as you commit your life to him. Father, I thank you for Jesus. I want to open my heart, my life, and invite him you inside. Forgive me of my sin. Wash me clean. I want to follow you from this day forward. And I thank you for giving me eternal life and the abundant life now. And God, I pray that you would give me the strength not only to make this decision here, but Lord, to act like an alien out there Lord, because the world is lost and I have found the answer in you. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.